Okay. Welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for your time tonight. Good to see everyone back. Um, we've got a special treat for everyone tonight. Live from London, we've got Deljit Banger, the CEO of Seek Consulting. Um, tonight, at Eljit's also a fellow of the BCS, so the British Computer Society, who's a sister organisation of ACS, um, and we're privileged to have him with us this evening. Tonight we'll be talking about Solutions Architecture Revived, um, around architecture in context and roles and responsibilities. As always, you can see the Q&A button down the bottom of your screens or, or within the platform. Please use that, this is very interactive. Daljit spoke to me earlier and he said he really wants an interactive session, so feel free to send your questions through the Q&A. Um, on that note, over to you, Daljit. Oh, right. <coughs> Hi, can you see me? Yeah, all good. Right, okay. Hi, my name's Daljit Banger. Um, I currently co-chair the BCS Enterprise Architecture Solution uh, Specialist Interest Group. Um, I'm a British-based consultant with three decades of IT experience. Today I'm going to present um, some of the stuff material that I've presented before and um, it really is about you know, enterprise architecture, solutions architecture and also some of the roles and responsibilities. My bias is always about realisation so if you've got any questions about how to do certain things in the field, happy to share. Um, I've also, what I've done is with the slide deck, you may find that some of the material I present now is going to be um, uh, crowded. I mean, some of, the, some of the pictures, I've put a lot of content on the pictures, sorry, on the slides. So that way you can take them away, digest them. And if you do have any questions, feel free to contact me direct. Right, so let's start. Uh, right. So as I said, the webinar is going to be in two parts. Part one, really, I'm going to talk about enterprise and solutions architecture, put some context around it, introduce you to something called what I call the stack, which is a tool I use to explain the mindset. Um, we'll then expand on that stack and we'll talk about some of the touch points within programs um, and how enterprise architects will interact with you know, certain stakeholders in order to achieve certain outcomes. I'll also touch on some architectural artifacts. Um, I've not got any examples with me today, but I will go into what I think. There's two key artifacts that I want to discuss, so hopefully you'll find that interesting. Part one, roughly about 20 to 25 minutes. Part two, um, similar type of um, timing and we'll talk about the roles and responsibilities. If at any point in time you want me to focus on say part one, feel free, we can always go back to it. Um, but hopefully with you know 50 minutes we should cover quite a bit of content. Okay? So let's begin. <laughs> right, first of all, and this is a quick slide I've put up. You know, there are several architectural frameworks out there. We've got MODAF, we've got TOGAF, we've got ETOL, you know, we've got FIF. There's loads of architectural frameworks out there that give you a lot of collateral that you can use, yeah? Um, and it's all about delivering and managing enterprise architecture capabilities, okay? So I'm not going to discuss any one of these frameworks because A, they're well documented, and B, I think you have enough people talking about these frameworks. Um, each one should be used within the context of the environment you're operating in. Um, if we look at MODAF and DODAF, they're very, you know, if you're building a tank, fantastic. Um, you know, they may, you know, if we look at um, TOGAF, that's more kind of, you know, you've got your architectural development methodology and it's going through the life cycle, more on the commercial side of things. ETOM is really about telecoms. You know, these frameworks are out there. I've put this slide there just to let you know that, you know, they are out there. You know, go and, go and investigate. They kind of, there's a lot of good work. I mean, I sat on the um, TOGAF committee for five years. A lot of hard work goes into these frameworks. So they are worth looking at. Um, however, 
as I said at the um, beginning, we're not going to touch any one of these frameworks. So I want to park all of these frameworks. But, you know, out of respect to them, I just want to make sure that you are aware that they are out there. Okay. Right. Before we talk about these frameworks, uh, sorry, before we move on to the stack, sorry about this, I just, I just want to just want to throw something out there. Um, and really, you know, I mean, the slide kind of sums it up. The enterprise architecture is not the same as enterprise systems architecture, you know? Sorry, do I have a... Sorry, I'm just hiding the questions. So, basically, they are kind of two disciplines. Um, and the reason I say that is because I don't, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but in Europe, we seem to have people calling themselves enterprise architects. Depending on their background, depending on what they've been exposed to, they have a certain mindset. And it's very important to highlight the fact that, you know, enterprise architects and enterprise systems architects are two different beasts. And if we look at enterprise systems architects, which I classify myself as one, you know, my focus is primarily on aligning the technology landscape with the business operating model and some of the business outcomes. But the key word there is technology landscape, alignment, business operating model. When we look at enterprise architects and we look at the work of guys like Tom Greaves, the focus is really about how do you construct an organisation to deliver certain outcomes. And the key word there is constructing the organisation, constructing the enterprise, okay? So it's very important to distinguish between enterprise systems architecture and enterprise architecture. And basically, I, I've put some points here and I've said, you know, enterprise architect support, unified and blah, 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 capability that meets the organisation. The goal of the EA is to, and this is where I'm, my bias comes in, it's really about alignment and management of the technology landscape. Now, with that in mind, and with that bias in mind, I'm going to walk through the stack um, and then introduce certain things. So we're not going to talk about how to reconstruct an organisation to achieve its outcomes. You know, this is really about the technology side of things. And I hope you're OK with that. Just something to consider. Right, so now I'm going to give you a quick introduction. Um, as I said, we're not going to talk about any other architectural frameworks. We're not going to talk about pure enterprise architecture, about architecting the enterprise. Um, what we are going to do is talk about alignment. Okay, so in front of you, you've got a slide which I call the stack. And I reuse this as a way of trying to highlight what how you would align the technology landscape to the business operating model. So let's go through each layer and then I'll give you an example. So at the very top, every organization operates, yeah? It's a functioning being, entity. That, that being, that entity has a model and within that model, there are certain certain elements that impact the way that model is constructed. So, first of all, I've got, I've got to highlight the fact that a business operating model is not the same as a business model, okay? A business model, you know, we've got various patterns for business models, you know, we may have a business to business type organisation. Um, a business operating model is slightly different. That is more about how the business is operating. And within that, we have various things that can impact the operating model. For example, um, external forces. In the UK, we've got various legisl legislation that we've got to comply with. So, you know, that affects the operating model. Um, you know, the Data Protection Act, um, that's a prize example. You know, that affects the way you operate, the way you collect information, the way you push it out. Um, that, you know, that information, uh, and resources, the way they're pushed and pulled inside the organisation, that affects the operating model. Um, the way the business is structured, the physical and the logical structure, you know, 
Um, that affects the operating model. So at the very top of this stack, we've got something called the business operating model. Within that operating model, we may have various business models that support the operating model. Now we can flip this on its head. We can flip this on its head and say, we've got a business model and we've got an operating model that supports it. But what I'm trying to do highlight here is that at the very top, we do have this operating model. Now this operating model is supported in order to function, in order to execute, um, is supported by business processes, okay? Um, and I'm not here to teach you what a business process is because I'm sure you already know. But you know, business processes, they may be formal, informal. You may outsource some of your business processes. Some of the processes may be straight through, they may be called off, um, they may be manual, they may be automatic, but in order to support this operating model, there is a set of business processes which basically support the operating model. In order to realize these business processes, every organization has capabilities or services, okay? These capabilities and services support these processes. You see where I'm going? I'm trying to build my way slowly down the stack. These capabilities, they could be, you know, they could be technical, technical capabilities. Email, for example, is a technical capability. They could be the channels, the channels of how you render information to your customers, um, how you communicate with your customers, how your business processes interact. Um, those could be capabilities. You know, I've also put something innovation. That's a capability in its own right, you know, the, the, the innovation funnel and how that interacts with your business processes. So now at the very top, we've got this business operating model. Below that, we have a set of business processes that support that operating model. And then we have some capabilities, okay? And how do we render these capabilities? How do we deliver these capabilities? Well, normally it's through various applications. These applications could be custom off the shelf, they could be bespoke, they could be in-house, they could be developed, you know, it really varies. And these applications, <clears throat> you know, these applications render or deliver these capabilities, these capabilities support various business processes, these business processes support the operating model, okay? Below the applications, we, you know, we've got data and information services. And what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to go through the stack. Now you can move these around depending on your organization, okay? Data and information services, data warehouses, how you classify your data. So for example, if you are a security focused organization delivering something for the government, you may, you know, a lot of your a lot of your data and information may be classified and classified. Now that has to feed into the way the applications handle it. Also how the capabilities and services deliver that to support the business processes and then how those business processes function within your business operating model. Okay. Below that, we've got two other layers, the services layer and the enabling technology. The services, you know, this is really now we're moving into the technology domain. So we talk about messaging, messaging as a service. Um, we talk about logging, we talk about monitoring. These are all services which are normally made up of other enabling technologies, okay? And when we look at the enabling technologies, we could talk about pervasive devices, you know, fixed mobile. We could talk about, you know, the hosting, you know. We, we keep hearing about the cloud. Sorry, I should say that, should I? We keep hearing about the cloud, but really we're talking about you know, are we hosting our information, our data, our information assets, you know, with third parties? You know, the way you, you know, physically it will be stored on a device somewhere and it will be hosted somewhere. So, you know, we can put nice titles around it, but, you know, how we host that information. Now, little things like cabling, um, you know, they, these, these little things, the enablers, I mean, how do you cable up a building? Okay, you may want to introduce Wi-Fi, but how you cable up a building, how you cable up your data centers, these are all things that need to be part of the stack. And then you've got your appliances, you know, your servers, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now, 
I've talked about the business operating model, I've talked about the business processes, I've talked about the capabilities, and I'm trying to show a linkage between each one, okay? You can move these around. Um, but before I move on to the next one, just checking to see if there's any questions. No, so we're fine. A wrap around all of this is what I call the value added, the hygiene services, you know? So things you would, when you're, when you're designing a system, for example, the non-functional capabilities, you know, DR, security, um, governance, compliance. Now I've put this at the bottom of the stack because really this is a wrapper around the whole stack, okay? Now if we step back, if we step back and we look at the stack, the top part of the stack, the top part is very business focused, you know, your operating model, you know, the business models you're operating within your operating model, the business processes, your capabilities and services, very much business orientated. And then as we go down the stack, you know, we're starting to talk about the technology side of things, okay? Now, just have a drink. Now, all of these are interrelated, okay? And each layer in the stack can be further decomposed. And I'm gonna present a picture, probably two slides down, a lot of content on it, but I just want to show you some decomposition of each layer. Yeah, and each layer is pushing up or down and consuming from above or below. Okay, so I'm just going to move on to the next slide. And what I'm trying to say is that this this stack, right? And I've tried to use. I normally would stand up, but I won't. So if we look at the very top. And I use this as an example. We've got a new law coming into um, the UK in 2018 called GDPR. And I've used that as an example where an external force, a government, in our case, the European Union, is imposing a law which will affect our organization, okay? And the way that law, it's, it's basically a replacement of the Data Protection Act, yeah? And it just gives um, the, you know, the information, the person, the information is about a bit more uh, rights. But that law, the way that law is going to affect people, it will affect the current business processes, both formal and informal, the way you collect information, the way you process information, it's all going to affect it. And as an organization, you need to start thinking, right, okay, well, let's look at the channels. Let's look at the capabilities and services. How do you collect information on individuals? You now have to tell them you're collecting this information and you're gonna process it. So straight away, you've got to start thinking about the channels. You got to then start thinking about the technical elements. And you also got to start thinking about new processes and how you innovate to capture certain bits of information. Even if you're a British company, um, European company operating abroad, you still got to think about it. And then that, if that could affect the way COTS packages, for instance, if you're using SAP ERP, you now have to make sure that, you know, any information you're holding about an individual that's probably captured through a public facing portal, you know, can be audited. So you have to look at some of your COTS packages. You then may want to look at how your in house applications are done. Well, you know, not may want to, you will have to, okay? And then what I've tried to do is I've gone all the way through the stack looking at the areas that would be affected by one simple piece of legislation, okay? And what that try, what I'm trying to do with that diagram is basically say to you, look, we've got this stack, no matter, you know, at a very high level, any impact on your business operating model will have a downstream impact. However, it will also, you know, it works both ways. Anything you do in your enabling technology, for instance, you may want to introduce, um, the, I'm working with a client at the moment who's talking about introducing 52,000 tablets for a government organization, okay? Now, you know, straight away, you've got to think bottom up, not top down, you know. There is a business requirement for that, okay? But you're now talking about, right, okay, so you're introducing 52,000 tablets. What kind of information are you going to store on those tablets? What applications are going to use those in, you know? And so what I'm trying to say is that it's a bi-directional process, okay? I hope that's 
kind of enlightened you on the stack. Okay. Now, I see no questions as yet. I'm sure there will be. Um, so if we move and we look at that stack, if we take that stack, okay, that stack is point in time. Okay. So any any point in time, you know that your operating model is going to be aligned to your technology at any given point in time. But over time, things change. External forces come. You know, um, you may have new channels that you want to introduce. So there are transitional states that must feed into something for target. So for instance, if you're writing an ICT strategy, for example, you're going to look at where you are today. And this is really a no-brainer. You want to know where you're going to, and you want to know how you're going to get there. But the mistake a lot of people make is that that is not a one-fold jump. Okay, by understanding the stack, you can then start saying, well, there's not one target, you know, to be and target, you know, there is no one interim state, there are multiple interim states. And you need to factor that in when you're doing your budgeting, when you're doing your planning for any technology, you know, you've got to look at product roadmaps. Um, we mentioned SAP earlier on, you know, we know HANA came along a few years ago, you know, that has to be introduced into some of your transitional states. How are you going to introduce that? So, what I've discussed so far is the stack. I've talked about the interaction between the layers within the stack, and I've also said that from your current state to your target state, there's some interim transitional states. Now, for any enterprise architect, that's a lot to take in. Okay, but this is just a backdrop. Yeah. Right, now I've, I've put this diagram up and I know you can't read it and I apologize for that, but it is available via the PDF and do have a look at it. So what are the tools, what are the tools and methods you can use as an architect, as an enterprise architect to understand the stack? Now at the very top, Okay, and I'm going to use stuff that most people are probably aware of. So when you're looking at the business operating model, if we look at the top uh, right-hand corner, I don't know if it's right-hand on your screen, the top right-hand, I've got three, three elements. And one of those elements is standard business SWOT analysis, strengths, weakness, opportunity, strengths. We've got Porter's five forces, and then we've got structured conduct performance. So that's one way of looking at a business operating model. There are other ways of looking at it. Also, the thing about the top layer is if you start looking at external forces, you know, what is the impact on the enterprise, both internally and externally? When, you, when you're looking at an enterprise, you know, you've got to start thinking about, you know, if someone is interfacing you with, you know, externally, if they change something, what impact is that on your um, operating model? And the top layer is just some tools. So when you do get a chance, um, do go away, have a look at this diagram. If you've got any questions, please contact me direct because I am evolving this diagram. So any, any comments, any criticisms, I would welcome. Um, when you do look at, and if you do print this diagram out, print it out in A3, strongly recommended. Um, at the bottom, I've highlighted how your external forces um, how you're pushing and pulling information into your organization at the business operating model may affect your non-functionals at the very bottom hygiene layer. So I've added a bit more meat to the bone, but I hope that you know you can take this diagram away, have a look at it, and you know, this is really about the next level of decomposition. So we started with the stack, and what we've done here is we've said, right, okay, let's go down and decompose this one, one layer down. And it shows you some of the tools and techniques that you can use in order to fully understand the stack. Okay. Okay, we don't have any questions on that, but if anyone does have any questions and they want to come back, feel free to post it. Okay. So let's just recap before we move forward. We talked about a notional architectural stack, okay? And each layer of the stack um, introduces various elements that will allow us to manage the technology landscape. Not only manage it, but also, and the key word here is alignment. You know, 
And a lot of our time as systems architects is about aligning, um, aligning the systems, the technology landscape with where the business is going, okay? So we talked about the stack. We've got this notional model that we can use to help us understand all the pieces in the jigsaw. Now let's talk about some of the products that will actually support um, the stack, okay? Now, as I said, I'm not talking about any other architectural frameworks. However, if we look at Toga, for example, there's some excellent um, artifacts that they describe in both TOGAF 8 and TOGAF 9, which you could use. The same applies also in DODAF, um, our military version. So, you know, it presents different views and how you can look at things. But what I'm doing is I'm going to present you with a generic list, okay? But before I do that, I just want to highlight two things, okay? First of all, one size doesn't fit all, okay? And the reason I say that is you as an enterprise architect, or as, uh, not so much a solution architect, but you can spend a lot of time, um, a lot of time assembling artifacts, putting them together, and not delivering any real value to your business, okay? So the key thing to remember is sometimes, you know, depending on the size of the organization and time to market, some of these products need to be um, quite lean. Um, sorry, I'll just... Give me one minute, I'm just playing about with the screen. Um, so, the size of the organization does affect the um, artifacts that you're going to produce. Okay, so for instance, um, for instance, if you've got a small, if you've got a large organization, okay, so you may have a team of five architects, okay, application, data, information infrastructure and network, you may have five architects. Now really, looking at the capabilities of those architects will affect the type of products you're producing. So, for example, um, if I don't have a network architect, which, you know, would be quite surprising, I won't have a single unified view of the network connectivity between all my data centers and between all of the systems, you know, because no one's produced it. However, the odds are there is some knowledge internally that understands how that all hangs together, okay? So once again, one size really doesn't fit all, okay? And it really, depending on the organization, will affect the type of products you're producing, okay? Also, the relationships within the organization. I, I was asked by a very large government agency with a budget hundreds of millions to actually disassemble their architecture team, okay? Now, the interrelationships between the architects and the business weren't great. So, you know, stepping back, I had to look back and look at how we would deliver the outcomes. We did end up dis dismantling it because it, you know, the function was clearly needed. It just needed a different line of sight and the way it was handling itself. So the relationships are quite important, okay? Now, the reason I'm kind of dwelling on this basically is because, you know, you can't always produce. The next slide is going to be a list of things that you're going to have, you know, you may want to produce. You can't always produce these things and you've got to manage that. Okay. okay. Now, what we can do is all the products we produce, doesn't matter the size of your organization, we can put into three domains, control, inform, direct. The products you may um, produce can be related to the way you control things. So your governance processes, your business partner engagements, you know, the whole processes of how you control that, okay? And also, as an architect, how do you direct certain things to make sure you achieve your outcomes? You know, we often, in this new agile world, we have projects come in left field that really want to just get something out through the door. So how do you not only control it, but how do you direct that, okay? So this diagram basically shows some of the elements that, as an architect, you have to think about and maybe things that you may produce. So for instance, if you've got a project, which is probably the next slide, you know, you want to look at how you are, you know, defining your application architecture. But on the same time, 
you want to be pushing the, pro the program or project to make sure you, it's kind of aligned to where you want to go. The way you do that is by informing them, you know, what your principles, your policies and all this kind of stuff. Now, one thing I would say is that architectural principles, architectural policies, great stuff. They need to be produced. It's all been done before and you can reuse a lot of um, architectural principles that have been produced by third parties. You don't have to do it yourself. So if you've got one guy sitting in the corner spending a month knocking out architectural principles, that's not good, okay? But as I said, it depends on the size of the organization. Right, so what I've done is I, I talk about control informed direct. Let's look at a typical project, yeah, okay? A delivery focused project. Now, within a delivery pro focused project, you may want some assurance on the application estate. You know, you may want to produce, well, you will have to, you will have a solution design document. Now, how does the enterprise architect interact with a program of delivery um, in terms of, you know, solution designs? Well, it's there to act as, you know, assurance. So it's all about control. You can't, you're not part of the program, but you can step back from it and you can control some of the variables. Um, when it comes to engage with suppliers, you know, you may, you may just want to inform the suppliers of your standards, okay? So as an enterprise architect, when you're looking at a project, you work with the solution, uh, solution architect to say, right, okay, you know, this is, how, you know, and basically you inform them. Okay, and you can inform them with some of the artifacts you produce. You don't have to be stuck in there all the time. Okay, um, so hopefully, you know, take away this diagram and I'll try to transpose control informed direct onto a kind of standard program. Okay, now, and this is a Okay, so that's a standard project. But now let's look at something which we're coming across quite a bit. So I, I was asked by a large company, uh, the, the enterprise architects there, how should they engage with agile type programs, right? Okay, where time to market is reduced. So a lot of the artifacts that you would expect don't get produced. How do you engage with those type of projects? My response was, okay, well, if we look at how a typical scrum type project works, you know, from idea generation to sprint re retrospectives, you know, where can you get involved? Now, what I've done on this diagram, I've said, right, okay. So as an enterprise architect, I would like to get involved in the daily scrum meetings to see how things are going. And if there's anything that's gonna have a drastic impact, I also, want to be informed of the sprint reviews. How are things, you know, what are the things that need to be redone? Also, I want to be informed of the product backlog. Is there anything there in the product backlog that they are going to create that we can reuse in the enterprise? So when working with a agile scrum type project, yeah, there are things that you as an enterprise architect, even a solution architect, can engage with, but also at the same time take away. Okay. I've also at the same in this diagram, I thought I'd throw in the whole six sigma, you know, uh, define, measure, analyze, improve, control, because it doesn't matter if your project is a small project which is structured in a certain way to achieve rapid outcomes. You can still look at ways to improve things. You can still measure things. You know, um, and I've put a link here, so when you do get the slides, and if you're interested, um, I put a link to a program called um, Silicon Valley. It's my favorite program. And they talk about Scrum. So the link's there. Have a look at it. Feel free to, uh, you know, that, the, that's a bit of humor you may want to look at. Okay. Right. <laughs> it's quite good, actually. I, I love Silicon Valley. It's just my favorite program. So do have a look at that diagram. If you're working as an enterprise architect or working as a solution architect, and you do have a segment of the organization which is looking at rapid deployment. And let's be honest, you know, um, and I've put a quote there. Uh, yeah, okay, so I've got a question here. 
Isn't communication and collaboration be the responsibility of the Scrum Master to ensure the architect is involved there? I think it's a bi-directional thing. I'll tell you why. And this is just from my experience. So I'll, I'll happily, um, I'll answer live. Okay. So, yeah. So this is from my experience. I worked with a very large company that were developing quite a major part of their organization using, and this is where this diagram came from. Okay. Now the scrum master gets on with it. Fine. Gets on with it. But as an enterprise architect, and let's go back to the stack, this may be one small project within a bigger organization. So let, let me give you an example. Say for instance, you're using, and I talked about SAP ERP. Say for instance, you're using SAP and you've got that within your organization and you then want to introduce a manufacturing execution system. Yep, you've got to connect that to SAP. However, there may be part of that manufacturing execution system that you want to modify. So there may be something which says, right, paint the shelves um, yellow. Right? And you may want to customize that system. Okay, Now, you may follow this approach. An enterprise architect or a solution architect that's not engaged in the project may think, okay, we may want to paint something else in another part of the company yellow. So the engagement is really about informing and directing. Okay, I agree the Scrum Master, the role of the Scrum Master is quite critical. And yeah, but the thing is, as an enterprise architect, you're looking at the big picture. Okay, and sometimes when you're looking at the big picture, you've got to get involved with some of the little pictures. As an observer, maybe, um, maybe not a contributor because you're not there day in, day out. But my recommendation, and this is just my recommendation, is as an enterprise architect, if you do have a project sitting in the corner that's in full flight, you know, attend some of the scrum meetings, the daily scrum meetings. So at least you can find out what you're, what's going on. So, um, I, I hope that answers that. So, you know, the question was, communication and collaboration be the responsibility of the Scrum Master. I fully agree with that, it is. However, as an enterprise architect who's maintaining a macro view for the whole of the organization, um, you've got to get stuck into some of these things. So I hope that answers that. Yeah, and I suppose something to, to elaborate that on a little bit further is, yeah, um, I'm not 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 a technical background. I put it out there. But what out of take your technical discipline out of this? What do you think the three key skills are to be successful and and deliver projects? Um, you know, add to scope. Right. We're going to talk about the traits as we move away from yeah, yeah. the the products. So uh, you know, I'm looking at time. I'm going to quickly go through the products. And then I'm going to move on to the roles and responsibilities. And in Fantastic. the roles and responsibilities, I'll talk about some of the characteristics. Um, Fantastic. You know, yeah. and, and some of these characteristics are standard to most functions, not just enterprise architects. Yeah. But I'll, yeah. go, I'll yeah. specifically focus on enterprise solution and technical. So Great. bear with me. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> right, so I'm going to move on from this. I hope that answered the question. Um, good question. Right, now this diagram that you see in front of you um, is basically some of the artifacts that you would um, manage as an enterprise or solution architect. You know, And I'm not going to go into each one because we just don't have the time. And what I've tried to do in this diagram is say, right, control inform direct, and what are the standard artifacts? Now there's two artifacts that I just want to quickly go into. One is API management. Okay, no organization is an island and you're interfac interfacing with other, other organizations. So the way you interface your application program interfaces between your internal systems and your external systems are quite important. And I think this hasn't been in the forefront of many, many companies that I've worked with. And I, I think for me, having worked with a, a, a client at the moment, I think the way we manage the interfaces between the organization systems and external systems is quite an important thing. So I think a catalog needs to be kept there. Okay. So I'm throwing that out there, but you know, that, that's one for debate. The other thing is the reference models, um, your technical application, your roadmaps. You know, the thing about these models, I think they can be heavy, you know, because to write a product roadmap for a COTS project 
you know, um, can be quite a heavy task. But for me, keep these lightweight because they do change. They do change. Roadmaps always change. And remember, remember the point I'm trying to make here is that everything is aligned to the business operating model. If the business operating model changes, everything downstream changes. Now, you can't be tied into your reference models. They're there for a reason because they're there to make sure that reusability and all the other favorite words we use reduce our time to develop systems. But the reason I'm highlighting these two as worthy of discussion is because APIs, definite, you know, we are becoming a more interconnected world. So the way we manage those interconnections, very important. The second one is reference models. I've seen some reference models and you know, I can some of the banking ones I've seen I can fully understand because the business model isn't going to change that much. Okay, but when you're talking about consumer-based models, reference models, you may want to think about keeping them lightweight. And I threw that in there, just something to think about. Okay. This diagram, uh, you know, have a read of it in your own time, but I just wanted to highlight process orchestration and business operations. Have a, have a read of this. If you've, got, you know, if you've got any questions, feel free to fire them off. But these are just more things that you have to think about, okay? It's quite a lot you have to think about. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, now let's go into the roles and responsibilities. Um, with 15 minutes remaining, I think I've gone over a bit on the stack, but I think it was a good conversation to have. All right, good, yeah, very good. Let's talk about the roles and responsibilities. Now, this is covered by a lot of people. Now, in the UK, the British Computer Society have a model called Sophia Plus, okay? And Sophia Plus basically breaks down the way the skills required for certain jobs. Yeah, we're we actually... The, yeah, we, we have adapted the Sophia framework as well within our organisation too. Okay. Yeah. As, as a quick note, the BCS are rewriting the solution and enterprise architecture exams. I'm actually involved in that and we're changing the way they're going to be presented. So that, that's something to look forward to because they will be proper architectural type exams. Okay. Now, what I've done here is I've taken the Sophia Plus model and I've said, right, strategy and architecture at the top, relation and engagement. And what I've tried to do is the blue elements, so on the right-hand side, we've got enterprise solution and technical architects, the roles. And what I've tried to do here is say, right, the blue bit is the skills that you, so as an enterprise architect, you need skills in strategy and architecture. You need skills in change and transformation. You need the delivery and operation skills. Maybe not as much as a solution architect, but you do need them, okay? Uh, relationships and engagement. You know, you need those type of skills. Those are the skills that are required by an enterprise architect. How you get them, I've got, um, I did another pre presentation where I said it evolves over time and it's through engagements. Some of this stuff can be taught, but a lot of it is um, in the field. Now, if we look at the solution architects, now because those solution architects are primarily focused on a project, um, the skills mix slightly changes. They may not need to be that fully conversant with the business change management side of things. However, if they're working on a program, then they would be. Um, so what I've done is the grey boxes represent where I think they don't need as much as the enterprise architect. And for the technical architect, you know, it depends what they and it, it does depend within the context of the organisation what they are doing. Okay, and I've called it exposure and non-exposure. Um, feel free to take that. And have a read of it okay and on the left hand side of the diagram i've put the stack and where i think the skills lie with in relation to the stack okay so the enterprise architect i said doesn't really have to be too a fave with the service enablers and the technology enablers however from my experience i kind of think they do but that's just something that we can have a debate about for hours on end okay yeah. And um, any of the members can uh, jump online in their member portal and do the MySophia self-assessment um, around this role and really see the full scope of uh, discipline skills that you require in this type of role. So jump on and do that, everyone. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on. 
Now, the next few slides are going to be very textual, okay? Um, and the reason I've made them very textual is because this is stuff that, you know, I can put out there and I can talk about, but really you need to go away and read and just digest it. So I said the role and responsibility of an enterprise architect is really about maintaining the organisational abstract view, okay? Um, you can't always get your hands too dirty. Um, however, saying that, I'm, I'm finding some engagements you have to, okay? And what I've done is I've listed some of the roles, responsibilities that are required, the strategic input into technology roadmaps. I've, I've just included this one, Insight. I included that yesterday um, because I was talking to someone and I thought, mm, that's an interesting point. And it's really, the insight is understanding the deficiencies of both the products um, that are deployed and some of the services and the way those services are deployed in the technology landscape. And that insight allows you to go away and investigate. So I'm looking at a print solution for a large client at the moment. And just by understanding the way it's deployed, um, I'm thinking, you know, should I be looking at something else or should I be focusing my thoughts elsewhere? So I've included insight. The rest of the stuff, the influence, the consultancy, the policing, the representation, the impact, these are kind of stuff that you'd read anyway. So I've put them out there. They're in no specific order, but these are the roles, responsibilities, and some of the skills you need, okay? Now, the next slide is really about the technical architect and the solution architect. I tend to talk about the enterprise and the solution architect a lot. So I wanted to throw some stuff in about the technical architect because there are stepping stones. A good technical architect will then, you know, if we were looking at career progression, would then move to become a solution architect and then move even further. Um, so what I've done is I've put some text about the technical architect and the solution architect. I'm going to, I wanted to talk about the solution architect just a bit more, but for now, the te technical architects, really, these are, you know, you'd be lost without, let's be honest. These are the guys that are, you know, um, looking at the way your patching, patching works on some of your servers, look at how your systems are performing. You know, this is the low-level stuff. These are the guys that actually are hands-on. Um, and really, the way you can work with these guys, and this is just my opinion, right, is use them to mitigate any technical risk, okay? Any technology um, environment you're working as has technology debt of some kind. And the way to work with your technical architects is really understand that debt and look at ways of how you can mitigate some of that debt, okay? So I've thrown that in there because I really wanted some background there, okay? That's quite important. Solution architects, so enterprise, we talk at the macro level, solution architects work with projects, okay? And really they manage cradle to go, sorry, cradle to grave, um, you know? And we're gonna talk about the process that they follow, okay? Now, I wrote, I wrote a blog about this not, not so long ago, so if you get a chance and you wanna have a look at this picture, but for a solution architect, there is a life cycle, okay? Um, Where's the Q and A got? Sorry, my Q and A thing went. Okay, there is a life cycle, right? Okay, and it stems from understanding the problem, putting some context around the problem. So before you even get to requirements, and this is why I get frustrated with some architecture methodologies. Before you even get to the requirements, you got to understand the problem. You got to understand the context. So normally there would be a business um, a business case written for a project. Okay, that's before the requirements are even elaborated. Okay, and it really is a good solution architect will get stuck in and try and understand what the problem they're trying to solve. And then the way this works is basically you've got your context, you've got your problem, you've got your requirements. So before you even start doing any conceptual level zero designs, you understand your functional, non functional, your organizational standards, and that all feeds into your. Um, conceptual level zero architecture. Once that's gone through the rigma and some of the validations, you then move into solution design and solution build. Um, 
and sorry, I thought that was a question. Um, and then you look at the options. Okay, have a look at this diagram. This is this is this for me was um, this all came about when I was looking at the role of the solution architect, and they do a lot more than just you know work with projects and you know come up with an idea. There's a there's a methodology of the way they come up with that idea. You know the options they got to select. You know do nothing. You know build by. You know modify. These are all parts of the thinking that a solution architect has to cover. Now, at each one of these layers, right, so we talked about how enterprise architects interface with scrum type projects, yeah. We're also, you know, what I'd also highlight is that enterprise architects, solution architects, you've got to work with these guys, okay. Um, I've both worked for them, I've both been one, I've both managed them, and I think, you know, at each level, for instance, the business case, okay, the PID, you know, project initiation documents. At that stage, you know, the solution architect's getting stuck in, but the EA can also get involved, not, not in a big way, but can get involved because there may be reusable capabilities that the EA can highlight for the solution architect, okay? Solution architects, I like program architects, the line of sight is to deliver to meet that specific outcome business requirement, whatever. It's that particular problem they're trying to solve, okay? Now the EAs have various touch points, and the touch points are at problem, at the problem definition, understanding what's going on there. Also at the requirements, because if you, if you want your organization to have, I don't know, you may want it to use, okay, this is just an example, but you may want it to use SharePoint as a method of content management. Okay, you know, the enterprise architects may be dictating that, but for the solution, there may be a better content management system. So you need to work with these guys, you know, on your various governance boards. Also, when you're doing your conceptual architecture, you're level zero, okay? You know, where you define your product backlog. But again, the EA has an interest in that function. Um, and also, when you're going for the options, you know. So what I'm trying to highlight here is some of the touch points. Now, in order to do that, there's certain skills you need. You know, you, as an EA, you may need to, well, no, I, I'm not going to say may, you do need to understand your technology landscape. Okay. And remember, at the very beginning, I did say enterprise systems architecture before everyone starts going off on one. Okay. Uh, you do need to understand what's deployed in your technology landscape. Okay. Have a look at this diagram. If you've got any questions on it, once again, you know, as I said at the beginning, there's a lot of material I'm throwing in here, and some of it does need digesting. Yeah. It's very Ooh. thorough. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Good. No, it's great. I, I want to show you that we in the UK do a thorough job. I get it, man. I'm okay. like, I'm like, and I get it now. And we were just chatting, saying, you know, it's a, it's really good, good to see the full scope of these type of roles and. Um, what's required from a skill set perspective. I think it's got all the audience really thinking a lot broader than they maybe were prior. So well done, that's no, great. Brilliant. Great. Brilliant. Right, so with three minutes to go, this is my final note. And I've taken a quote from Charles Darwin, um, and really is, you know, the fittest win, blah, blah, blah. And the reason I put that quote there, okay, is this. We're living in a we're living in an age. I grew up in the mainframes. Okay, I grew up, um, you know, where the systems life cycle was analysis, design, build, test, deploy. Okay, we're moving away from that now because time to market and globalization means that you know we don't have the luxury of spending a year uh, doing pure business analysis, right? Okay. And within that type of environment, we've got to adapt, okay? We've got to adapt, and we've got to be more leaner, agile, all the usual buzzwords that you hear. But the key thing is, the foundation of enterprise and solutions architecture is still there. The foundations are good. Sometimes, as I mentioned previously, when it comes to artifacts, you may have to reduce the size of these artifacts, but they all need to be produced. And the reason I'm saying that is because I worked with a client who was building a system that was going to have a 10-year life cycle, five-year contract, 10-year with extension. Now, 
it's all fine saying we're going to approach it from an agile way and deliver that system. Someone's got to support that system. Someone's got to maintain that system. If you've not done your documentation, okay, if you've not done the documentation before you put that system into live, you know, you're going to have problems downstream. Imagine trying to refactor. I, I looked at some AS400 RPG code, which we wanted to convert to Java. And you know what? Without proper documentation, it's really hard to understand how the system hangs together, okay? And the company I was working for, they're a billion pound turnover company, yet their systems were all AS400 based. And I was looking at how we could refactor those. You know, if they're not documented, people in the future will have problems. So you're not doing your company any favors. Anyway, that's the first point. The second point is, and I hope I've highlighted this, is that as EAs, we can't work in isolation. You've got to work with the projects, you've got to work with the programs. And, you know, and that was a very good question about the Scrum Master, but, you know, sometimes you have to get yourself there rather than be invited, you know. Um, be a gate crasher sometimes, you know, but do it in a nice way, okay? Um, the EA, this is a bit of a no-brainer. It's got to be delivered within the context of the organisation. If you are a 10 million pound turnover company, you know, you don't want to spend too much time um, building architectural artefacts when the focus is on realisation and time to market for everything. Um, and what I hope I've done, which, you know, tell, tell me, and if I've done an AF job, please do tell me. But what I've tried to highlight here is that we've got all these frameworks, but architecture, enterprise architecture, solutions are it's a way of thinking and once you understand how the patterns and relationships work i think you you know you add a lot of value to your organization okay and then on a final note this is you know you need to understand your technology landscape okay and it goes back to my first point we're talking enterprise systems architecture if you're in that space you need to understand how your technology landscape hangs together now that's it, and I've covered my hour with 10 seconds to spare. Man, on the duck, no. <laughs> I hope Man, you guys have found that useful. Yeah, um, no, I've got a couple of people just commenting saying great points and, you know, how thorough it was. I'm so, why we've still got you, does anyone have any questions uh, from the RG? Because, you know, we don't get this opportunity to have this expertise all the way from London, you know. Ask the questions while you can. And you know what, as I said, the slides are very packed. If you yeah. do have any questions, there's my email, blog, whatever, do contact me afterwards, you know. Yeah. Um, because yeah. by asking the questions, I, I, I kind of get to think, and that's, I need to be thinking. No one person is always right. No, but look, I, I think you've covered it thoroughly, and, and um, the, 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 you know, sometimes the, you know, not having questions also means that you've hit it on the nail on the head, and I think, um, everyone's starting to thank you now, and um, look, I really think you've provided the detail that I personally haven't seen in this space before. So it's been good to get a different perspective, and and from a global global point of view as well, and and with all your experience, so I think you've um, most definitely educated the people that are on this webinar today. Um, yeah. I think they'll have a lot to think about tonight when they go home and have a glass of wine. <laughs> Oh, yeah, sorry, I forget the time over there. It's early morning, yeah. Well, listen, oh, yeah. I, I, I hope that was useful, and yeah. you know, hopefully we'll do a few more of these. Yeah, most definitely, and, um, yeah, really appreciate your time, and I think, you know, those things really come through. So, Del, did on that? No, we might um, wrap up for today, but I think it's a phenomenal webinar, and um, really appreciate your time and your, and your thoughts today. And, um, yeah, as we discussed, being a sister organisation, we, we're going to look at working with the British Computer Society a lot more closely and seeing how we can share content with our members here in Australia. So, on that note, look, thank you so much, mate. We enjoy You're your welcome. day. Look forward to talking and, and speaking with you soon. Brilliant. Thank you very much. No worries. Take care. Bye-bye.